I sat down with my friend Mike Neely, who has just done some amazing translations of Sanskrit text, and we talked about the zodiac, Sanskrit translations, and a lot more. Check this out. Hey folks, I want to welcome you today uh, to this uh, special uh, video presentation that I have with my friend Michael Neely, also known as Prashanti. I've known him for a long time, and he's a Vedic astrologer and Sanskrit scholar. He's been doing some incredible work um, translating some of these ancient texts, and I wanted to have him on. We're going to talk about all, all kinds of cool stuff, zodiacs, translations, the history and transmission of astrology through the ancient world. Michael Neely, Prashanti, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Sam. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Well, I wanted to um, first thank you for doing these amazing translations and also coming on here today to talk with me about it. Um, just a real quick story. Mike and I met, what was it, 2004, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yep, at the ACFA conference. At the ACFA conference, we were, <laughs> we were roommates. Yeah, yeah, I remember and I did my level one certification course at that time. And um, Mike has just been an independent researcher for since that time, um, doing astrology readings, also very avid practicing yogi. And he got into, when did you get into um, Sanskrit and uh, translating the Sanskrit? Uh, well, uh, basically I took, you know, being in the yoga world when I started in uh 96 ish you know that's when i started to go to yoga studios and stuff like that and then um you know just being a part of the yoga world and then then realizing because i didn't really know at that time is yoga just like the chinese system has all these kind of things that you know benefit life the physical mental spiritual and all that and i didn't know that so um when i you know i you know one yoga studio had a sanskrit workshop so I actually went to the first one and there was a few, there was like 10 people there, I think. And it was really funny because they had a follow up and I was the only one who showed up. So that's kind of, and then, and then a, there is a, a couple of years down the road, then uh, a guy was just giving another Sanskrit workshop, but giving, you know, kind of like that learning the alphabet and just giving some very basics, like the noun and verb declensions and conjunctions and stuff, just very basic. And then, you know, once again, you know, after a couple of years, then I went to yoga teacher training around 2001. And then basically 2005 is, uh, you know, my one astrology teacher was doing the Sanskrit translation. So uh, just something, you know, you know, changed in me. I was like, oh, I want to try this too. And luckily, I knew a lady from uh, my, San my yoga world. And so she was had graduate work in Sanskrit and Hindi from the University of Washington. So I just emailed her and said, Hey, how much, you know, would you charge if you mentor me one-on-one? -on -one? And luckily she was very reasonable and she mentored, mentored me for about a year and a half. Wow. And, yeah, so and, you mainly got involved in it through your yoga, th th through your desire to translate like the yoga sutras uh, or at least through like the yoga tradition. Cause I've also known you mainly, I mean, even your email is like Yogi Mike. Is it still Yogi Mike? That that's actually yeah it, I have that email still and that was actually kind of like an inside joke with a, a fellow uh, yoga teacher of mine and when I first got on the hotmail I said oh I'll call myself Yogi Mike it was right. kind of like just an inside joke and so yeah and uh, and actually the forty four on my email is uh, it's kind of funny because at that time I was associating with some people who did angel work and they oh. say every time you see 44, that's supposed to be an angel in the presence of you. So it was kind of like a mixing of those two. So but, well, uh, I can really, you know, attest to your growth um, with the Sanskrit, because I remember when your, your first Sanskrit translations were, I don't remember when they start, you, you started floating them by. I mean, I, I can't translate Sanskrit, so I don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You could say anything, frankly, and I would wouldn't be able to translate it. But just noticing the detail and the voluminous, um, you know, how how much more you've been, uh, you know, the acceleration of your output has been really admirable. Um, and uh, is there anything like I don't know? It would be helpful maybe for some people to understand, like, what is it to what is it? What is at the heart of Sanskrit? Like, why is it such a powerful language? What is it that um, 
that's so, why is it so important? Um, you know, first of all, it's definitely something that I want to get into at some point. Um, but I'm so busy and I, it's kind of one of those things that I feel like I've sort of, um, neglected. And I'll tell you this, you don't even know this, but knowing that you're there translating stuff actually makes me feel like I'll let this guy do it because, <laughs> Yeah. Um, knowing that there's someone making such great translations has kind of made me also be like, well, if there's any ever anything that I really want, he he could probably do it. But what would you like to share about like the importance of Sanskrit, the sort of difficulty, the intensity? What is it about Sanskrit that's so compelling? Well, the thing first thing, and it is funny. The one thing I really want to drive home, and I've only actually known, uh, figured this out recently. Um, so basically, Sanskrit is a part of the Indo European language family um, on the linguistic side of the house, but also um, Sanskrit's only one of uh, three. There's three total languages uh, there's basically Greek, ancient Greek, um, Hittite, and Sanskrit, the Vedic Sanskrit, that was a part of what's called a proto Indo European language family. And uh, what's so fascinating about Sanskrit, though, is it's retained a lot of the features that have been lost in uh, all the other languages. So it's a very complex, very detailed. And the complexity is helps out a lot with the language, given there's so much. I mean, it's way more complex than Latin, as previous linguists have said. Um, and just the complexity, you're like, okay, these people weren't stupid. This is a very highly complex language. Um, I still, I mean, very few people can speak it verbally, like off the, off the cuff, because you basically can have so many ways of saying a word base and yet to change the endings of the verbs and the nouns and stuff. And what's really, so you basically have what's called like Vedic Sanskrit. And then basically this guy Panini um, basically codified it. And what's really amazing with that is he codified it with just 4,000 sutras using metacode. The whole grammar is in 4,000 sutras, which is really amazing. And then um, and another uh, kind of amazing fact is there's actually um, 2,000 known verb roots in the Sanskrit language. And actually only about 800 have been found in use in literature. Wow. And so that's, you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, we always talk about world tradition. It's like, well, there's 12, how a hundred verb roots uh, setting out there that have probably only been spoken orally or have been lost in text. So you're like, okay, there's a big chunk of the literature that either has been lost or was just oral tradition. Hmm. So, okay. and, <clears throat> and with knowing uh, Sanskrit, you really get to the etymology of the words. So when I'm translating, um, you really get at the heart of it. Like, for example, uh, the word, the verb root gum, it means to go. So a lot of times in, uh, in, in the translations, for to say that a planet is situated in a zodiac sign, they'll use gutta, which is means, uh, which is a past, uh, a past, <laughs> now it's, it's, it's a, a past passive participle. So it just means it's like, it's, it's kind of, it would be kind of say, oh, it it arrived at that point. It it went, but it's here now, you know. So uh -huh. right. they use that so, a lot. So yeah. like it's passed through, but now it's arrived here. Yes, exactly. So it means basically it's arrived here. So you're like, oh wow, that's how they use it. So that's how you can learn all these cool things about Sanskrit. Is it really getting to the like a lot of times they use the verb uh, the verb root hun to mean hit. So, you know, that's so when a, a, a malefic afflicts a planet, they'll use the word for hit, you know, and that's where like ahimsa is not hitting something, you know, right, Whereas, oh, right, ahimsa is hitting. So it's just all these cool verb roots. And, and actually, the Sanskrit language, one of the major commentaries, commentators, uh, I think his uh, name is Yasya, and he believed actually every Sanskrit noun derived from a Sanskrit verb. So every ever the language foundation is verbal. Mm, so okay, and that's that's really you get really to the meat of the language and and just to let you know uh, my detailed translations. Actually, that's how I started to learn because my mentor would come over and here's and actually she said, okay, you're going to get this book by uh, 
the Goldmans, uh, they're a husband and wife, uh, uh, you know, educators of Sanskrit. And I highly recommend this book if you want to start. It's very, very good. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit complex, but it's, it's, I, I think it's the best out there. And so we just, on the um, screen now I have like, this is from your Rita Yavana Jataka. This is the, this yeah. is how you break out the, how people can see the, yeah. the way you break it out. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So my mentor forced me to do this and, and I actually keep doing it because I'm not an academic. So I really want to, uh, when I put out a translation, I want to prove that I know what I'm talking about versus just putting a verse out there. And I really appreciate it when past translators have done that my, their, themselves. And because that really helps because there's a lot of, even like with the commonly translated Bhagavad Gita, um, there's just really a lot of complicated verses and how, you know, you can trans, you know, you can go from very literal to more poetic and there's this range. So I'm more of the literalist because I just really want to put out there like, this is what they're talking about. You know, and this, this is, is how they arrived at that, at yeah. that, at that statement. So folks, you know, there's, you know, you have a treat, you know, Mike has, has done all of these translations and they're available I, I assume just for download, right, Mike, on yes. at, at the academic. So we're going to have a link here under the video, and there are a couple of the ones. They're just fantastic. I mean, the reason I want to have them on is I'm looking at these myself, and what Mike has done is not just translate, but he's like, for example, one of them is this commentary on the Jyotish canon, Zodiac signs, planets, and strength. And you'll see these are full books, cross-referenced, and he takes all of these attributes, these common astrological attributes, I think um, – of many different qualities of astrology, and he looks at them through these, what is it, seven different texts, right? Yeah, it's like, yes, I believe uh, this, yeah, there's seven major texts, yeah. These seven I, major texts, he takes all these different subjects, Yavana Jatik, and, and looks at how each of these seven texts um, analyzed these different things, like the Rashis and the different qualities of signs and locations and all stuff from Yavana Jataka, Vridya Yavana Jataka, Brihat Jataka, Saravali, Horsar, Jataka, Parijata, Paladipika. Now, he doesn't do Parashra. Um, can you tell why? I mean, just maybe, no. you know, maybe because it's been translated a lot or something? So, um, there is another guy who commented, but what I found, and actually the Brihat Parashra or Shastra, that's actually the first one I started with. with my. Yeah, mentor. I remember. Yeah. So, um, so, when I was going through, you know, going through it, I first just, when you translate a language, you get the feeling for it. So every, just like every author is different and everything. So you'll, you can read someone's writing and say, oh, this is this person, or this is this person. Right. So when you come across the Briha Prasha or Shastra, and, and it was funny because when I did this canon review, I actually said, okay, look, I, I hate to be critical like that and leave that book out given it's such an in vogue astrology text. But when I tried to go back and incorporate it in this first canon review, it's just something's not right with it. Like the wording, the timing they're giving that text with the seventh, eighth century. Then when I try to compare it to like, you know, the Saravali. I was going to ask you about this. What I'm glad you're mentioning this. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, the the whereas like the Brihat Jataka is known to be very short and sweet, and the Saravali's not that. But when I was like, okay, wait a minute, here they're describing the iconography of the zodiac signs, and they're using this language that's like more dated. It's more later Sanskrit than it appears. It just seems like it's out of its time frame. So, so, so you're saying that you think that the real dating of, of what we're calling Briat Parashar Horasastra is probably much later. Yeah, or maybe it just got revised. So, for example, like the Vedanga right. Jyotisha, like obviously Jyotisha, like a Sanskrit word, the Sanskrit word Jyotisha is a Vedic word, meaning the, you know, the science of light or, you know, astrology slash astronomy. But as soon as you hit the classical period, it switches to the word Jyotis. So it means the same thing, but it's a different it's, word. But they use and, a different word. Okay. Yeah. So what I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not legit or anything necessarily, but I really think it probably got revised. So like I said, the Vedanga Jyotisha, 
it's a quote unquote Vedic text, but mean, it's written in classical language. You mean Brayat Prashahora Sastra or Vedanga um, Jyotish? Vedanga Jyotisha. So um so that's like, for example, this one scholar, that's one of his arguments that the Vedanga Jyotish is a little bit later than what it's dated uh, with that astronomical calculation in the text. He's like, wait, this language is not Vedic. It's classical. And I would agree with that because if you want some hard Sanskrit uh, translations, go to Vedic. It is difficult. Like, I feel like I'm lifting the heavy, heavy weights when sometimes I even do the Upanishadic translations. The so when we're doing uh, our, no, so, so just to, just to, you know, just to go back to, uh, so when we're, do, when we're talking about leaving out Brat Prash or Horus Sastra, though, there was like a same issue that you're saying that it's, it's usually said to be around the eighth century, but you're saying you think it was probably later. It could be, or they revised the text. Or it was revised. Yeah. And you're saying that you also agree. And I, I, I guess it was with Pingree, right? Um, where his his analysis was that the existent version that we have of um, Vedanga Jyotish, and you're saying from both recensions, from the Rig Veda and from the Yajur Veda, are probably later because of the Sanskrit. Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, and, and I know this was Pingree's assertion. He said that it was probably he 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 dated it. And I, I assume it was just based on the Sanskrit. I don't really know. I thought it was based on the Sanskrit that it was probably contemporary, maybe with the early Babylonian or, or the mid Babylonian period around the fifth, uh, you know, around the fifth century when they um, that same time of the Mullah Pin and things like that. Yeah, they usually push it to like, you know, like 500 BC or maybe the that's two. what I meant. 500 BC, I meant, excuse yeah, me, not fifth century, yeah. century BC. Yeah. And and Michael, uh, Professor Michael Witzel, he has a whole paper on that, which I, I, I link in the paper on the Vedanga Jyotisha. Just giving, I like to give the whole range. It's like, look, here. No, that's great. Look, people have to understand. This is one of the reasons why, and I wanted to say this yeah. to you as well here, um, is that one of the things that Michael and I have been doing for years, I mean, we've known each other 15 years, and we kind of started not, I mean, we actually knew each other before all of this stuff with the tropical Vedic and all of that started. We kind of, while, while some of that was starting, he and I knew each other and we've both been very open to exploring. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, you know, like just kind of looking, it hasn't really had our mind made up about those kinds of things. It's always been an open question and been, been very inquisitive about it. I kind of noticed very early that I didn't, I, I mean, it wasn't just based on what I believed looking in the text and whatnot, I was like, no, 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 there's no way they were ever using tropical or that it was ever confusing. Um, and I don't really rem remember what your views were on that. But the point of the matter is that I always know that you're very honest. And if you said, no, 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 this is this way, you would say it. It, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter what the convention is. Um, Michael will take a jackhammer to it if it's not correct, like he's doing right now. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people might get offended by the fact, and I'm the same way, frankly, I don't really know. And, but he's doing it in a way that's very fair. He's not saying, oh no, that means that, that the actual date of Vedanga Jyotisha or the Rig Veda or the Ajurveda isn't that old. It just means that the versions we have right now could have been revised. There's all kinds of ways that you can explain the same things. And this is one of the problems with people drawing too many conclusions from things that they see in these texts that are thousands of years old. There, there could be many explanations. Anyway, I just wanted to say that Mike is a very, very honest commentator in this regard. And I want to tell you, I always appreciated that about you. I always knew you weren't going to just, you're not just a religious fanatic. <laughs> yeah. I'm not either. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think that's one way that you and I really got along, actually, from the very beginning. It's always just been like, I don't know, man, what's true? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because I've, oh, I've, oh, I've always been a philosopher. So it's, right. you know, even even like a, a lot of people these days think science is the holy grail of truth. But actually, yeah. when you look at it very philosophical, it's, 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 it's a belief like anything else. It's a belief like anything else. And people yeah. don't like to see that, but they have their beliefs. Yeah. I say this all the time, even about astrology. I, yeah. I say that, you know, people ask things of astrology that they don't ask of regular science. Like you ask an astrologer to know how the universe works. You're like, well, how does astrology work? I don't know how it works. But yeah, the problem yeah. is you think that a doctor knows how the body works. Your mm -hmm. problem is you think other scientists know how anything works. Mm -hmm. But if you want to really get confused, ask a quantum physicist how the universe works. Or even just ask a doctor how the body actually works. We can see what the body does, but we don't know how it does what it does. Yeah. Yeah. So we're blinded by this belief in science, just like you said, this Western belief especially. 
And you'll see Western scientists, you'll see someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson get up and just spout nonsense about astrology that he knows nothing about it. Yeah. But he can do that because of the Western world. He is impervious to trashing astrology because there's no social penalty for it because everybody else shares the same collective disregard for it. But you go to India and say that or something, and it would be very different. Exactly. exactly. So there's this belief in the science. Oh, but he's a scientist in astrology. Well, that's not. That's it's all just a belief spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a, well, like my one of my favorite quotes. I think it's from the Isha Upanishad. Is like those who are in uh, who are ignorant are in darkness, and those who think it's basically say those who think they know are even deeper darkness. You know. <laughs> Yeah, because it's 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 like covering its trail. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like saying I know, and I know I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, so, yeah. so that's interesting that you're, and so the people that would say that no, the date of these of of this Vedanga Jyotisha and this Yajur Veda and and the um, Rig Veda is much older is because of the timing that's in it, where it says mm-hmm. where it's where it's acknowledging that the that the. Um, that the solstices and equinoxes are happening at Islesha and Dhanishta, which occurred yeah. 12 to 1500 BC. And again, it's possible that both are true, that the, that the text was written then, but these are old texts that were written on like palm leaves and stuff. Mm-hmm. Somebody probably came along at a later period and said, oh, let's rewrite this. Otherwise, it's going to be completely destroyed. And they were using it in the Sanskrit of their time or something like that. Yeah. I mean, think of songs. I mean, when people remake songs, right? They they revise it. It's the same right. song, but you don't expect an artist to make it like a a 1960s song. Yeah, like a 1960s. We have new recording technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and especially again, when you go back and look, especially what these things were written on. To me, it's incredible and amazing that any of it is intact. Yeah, we're talking things that were written thousands of years ago on pieces of on leaves. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> let's be real. I know. And I mean, plus, they probably, huh? Oh, and plus the the uh, environment in India is not conducive to yeah. those palm leaves. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so so it's in, it's entirely plausible that these things had been revised. Um, and and again, we have to look at those kinds of things. And instead of get hung up on these these little sticking points, look at the knowledge and the wisdom that is contained in them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And and the problem, I'll just say, and, and I'll get your feedback. One of the issues that some people had with some scientists, like, for example, with uh, Pingree and others is, is, you know, these men did great work. And I'm a, I, I'm, I agree with you. You know, I look at these books that I have, like books like this, this, mm-hmm. you know, you know, the interactions of ancient astral science and the history of the Zodiac and Babylonian star lore and all of these ancient and all these books that, that, that go back and look at these ancient sciences it's amazing work that these people did to translate like the Babylonian, um, you know, uh, cuneiform and the Indian Sanskrit, but then they wind up making proclamations maybe based on limited pieces of information. And then that's what kind of messes things up a little bit. Right. Exactly. You know, it's a, and that's the one thing when I was like, when I did that Canon review and I was just, you know, tracing Pingree steps and, you know, I just want to see like, oh, okay, let me see what I come up with. And, and, um, one of the things I did, you know, like we say, Pingree's amazing. I don't know where when he slept, but right, um, <laughs> yeah, it's incredible the amount of work he did. <laughs> so, but what I realized is he made a lot of generalizations. Like, for example, just the word like Hora, which can mean like a half a zodiac sign. It can mean the lugna, and it could also mean the whole chart. But literally, Pingree, you know, a lot, and Pingree and a lot of scholars say, "Oh no, no, they got that word from the Greeks." Definitely, right. here's here's just because it sounds the same and, and all this stuff. But when you actually look at the Indian side, which Indians weren't shy about giving the Greeks credit or, about or anything, right. or whatever. And, and they say right there, I mean, even Vara Mahira says, well, um, here's an alternative way to look at the horror because it came from um, hor- horatra, which means day and night, which with the um, grammar, that is a possible etymological origin. Um, I mean, you know, once again, it's like, I'm, I don't know for sure, but look, we need, you just can't make these blanket statements. There's definitely, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of it today with these kinds of things too. Oh, I see this one thing. So it means, you know, again, they, mm-hmm. they didn't know what the Zodiacs were. They didn't do this. It's like, you, you can't go that far with things. And 
one of the things what you know one of the reasons why pingree it's funny that i just pulled this up i didn't even know this was here i just started scrolling and here it is but here's your commentary on on pingree and and his yavana jataka commentary again i also found it to be really amazing and remarkable to read and also very conclusive when there's no reason to reach a conclusion especially when often the conclusion is okay this must have been a greek word so this proves that the greeks taught astrology to Indians. Again, this is just an insane leap to make. Mm -hmm. And of course, these things haven't aged well, and it hurts the reputation of all of the work when people overreach like this, unfortunately. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Because then it's hard to really benefit from a lot of the conclusions that they make, or even trust the translations and whatnot. And again, I still really find that many, that most of his conclusions were pretty, they seem to be quite honest for the most Mm -hmm. part. But it, but overall, some of the conclusions are really far-reaching. Exactly, yeah. Because, I mean, even, and I put that in the paper, that even Pingree says the transmission went back and forth. And, and he says, you know, we just don't know. Um, but, yeah, he did. I mean, if I would have one critique of Pingree, it's just he overgeneralized. Right. And even other, even, um, um, you know, modern, other modern scholars who do in this research have said that sort of thing too. That right. He was just a little bit too general. I mean, it was his PhD thesis. His whole career was wrapped around it. Yeah. So it's hard, you know, for someone when they're 70 years old or whatever to say, oh, I was wrong. It's And not only that, yeah. And not only that, the thing you just mentioned is really important. And it's also important for people like us, because anytime I've ever mentioned Pinger, again, it's worse on the internet. I mean, start doing stuff on the internet. There'll be people in this video, pingry, oh, and they'll just go crazy because they hear it and it's like bull in a china shop. Anytime they hear it, they lose their mind because of some overreaching statements. But again, the thing about it is that they they were also, like when you're doing something like a thesis, like for example, this book here, this book of Robert Powell, this was his doctoral thesis. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing a thesis, you're actually trying to form a new conclusion that actually the point is to come up with something, Mm -hmm. (laughs) not just document it. That's the point of academia is to, okay, take this. And now let's hear what you got, you know, come up with something instead of just document everything. Right. So what these scientists can tend to do is then overreach and say, okay, based on this and this and this, I form this conclusion about it. And that's the kind of stuff that can make others go, wait a minute, that's just too, that's not really supported. At the time, it might have looked correct, but then it doesn't age well. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's their job. Like you say, when they're doing PhDs, is to come up with new things. Powell's assertion here was 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 about the was about the nature of the zodiacs and that the tropical zodiac itself was was never meant to be a zodiac. It's a solar almanac, which it actually is. That's not even really in in a, in a dispute. But he went back and tried to make that assertion. But anyway. And again, so that leads him to controversy because those who don't think that say, well, why do you need to make all that? Why do you need to formulate that uh, conclusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, so there's also been some very interesting recent um, research into this whole area of the stuff that Pingree did um, that's quite new. And it also relates to the research that you did with uh, Riddha Yavana Jataka and other things like that. Did you want to talk about that? Because I found that really interesting. I think people will really enjoy hearing about that as well. Yeah. And like so, with Bill Mock, um, mm-hmm. you were explaining to me that there was another, uh, there's another researcher um, um, and there, some of this stuff is being sort of, um, you know, discussed right now. Um, anything you wanted to mention about yeah. that or at least some of the modern yeah. Um, you know, advances of, you know, uh, revisiting some of these ancient texts and some of the revised Sanskrit in them and things like that. Yeah. So, well, Bill Mock, he's kind of like, I would consider him the top person in the stuff that we study with the exact scientists in our area. And so I know he's been working on uh, a lot of the Garga uh, lineage because, you know, Garga was one of the main um, people. And I know pingree has been working on trying to uh, translate his text and and but so and the, just to step back a little bit just going from so how a manuscript becomes a book so you know you, basically like when you make a critical edition you go around and try to collect all the manuscripts and see what the difference is and then compare them and come up with a quote-unquote critical condi- uh, critical edition with saying well this passage said this but 
back on this one, this one said this, and there could be up to, I mean, tons of, of documents. And so I know Bill Mock's been working that. He's also been, uh, uh, I know uh, with, he, in fact, I got, um, I'm actually trying to find it, but basically there's this, um, with the Vritta Yavana Jataka, only two chapters, the first two have been translated into English. So, and so Bill Mock has done it. And then this, uh, another scholar, uh, Valerie Roebuck has done it. And then I've done it. And then, um, but actually, um, after the zodiac signs, planets, um, and strength evaluations of most chapters of the canon, then they talk about the next important topic is impregnation. So that's saying um, when you impregnate a woman, so, and that's the thing is, I, I like to stay away from conception because conception in a modern sense is not impregnation. It's a totally different meaning. So impregnation literally means when you discharge the semen into the woman. That's the moment of impregnation. And from that, you can um, tell if there's going to be twins, triplets, males, females, um, even hermaphrodites and stuff like that. It, it's, and it says, okay, this is what will happen with the fetus and this is how it will progress and all that stuff. That's so, in Rita Yavana Jataka? Yeah. And, and actually, uh, uh, most of the other texts um, talk about it, except the Paladipika doesn't talk about impregnation. But all yeah, the I know in in um, in Parashra there is a section on 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 the um, what's called the Nishekalagna, which is the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's yeah. called. Yeah, exactly. And so, so this is really this is another cool thing about Sanskrit. So Nisheka, so Nisheka, uh, the word uh, is Nish, which means to to uh, moisten or. So that's literally what the verb means. To oh, me. let's do some moistening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's weird. And there's like um, another verb that's in impregnation a lot. And it basically means to like to fall down, descend, fall down into something. So, and the best translation, uh, the best translation I have for that word is like to alight. Like when the semen is alighted into the woman, you know, but yeah, it's just really fascinating. So anyway, that that's the next it sounds kind of sexy nisheka. Yeah, yeah, nisheka. and so let's, let's get some nisheka happening yeah so <laughs> kind of um, like mituna reminds mm -hmm. me of mituna yeah exactly which can mean a couple so right. that can mean the so for and the, you bring up a kind of like with the word mituna well that can mean the zodiac sign of gemini right because it, it literally just means a couple it means a couple um, a couple uh a bonding and so when you translate, you got to be like, well, did they mean Gemini or did they mean couple or what did they mean? You know, did or they... bonding like a bond. Yeah, exactly. So you have because to... it's also literally like the sex, like when you come together, it isn't it's, it's and from what I understand, Sanskrit is more of the concept behind it. It's like the concept of something coming together and joining. So it can mean like a couple like I'm, I'm not necessarily saying mm -hmm. that this is what the. Matuna means, but like part of that is that it's the concept of it, not the specific thing. Like we say, you know, this is, you know, cup or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, pitcher, right? Yeah. With like, that's the name of the thing, but they would maybe have a word that actually means something like holding or, or supporting, like, mm -hmm. like the Sanskrit would be something that actually conveys the essence of what this is doing, not necessarily the object. Is that a yeah, exactly. Like way for, to try to explain it. Yeah, like in Sanskrit, a uh, common word they use for bearing is uh, brit, brit. So, like for example, the sword, the the bow bearer. So there's a word that'll mean Sagittarius bearing the bow, and like and and with the words that mean the sexual union, sometimes they'll they'll use the shaka, um, but they'll use yoga too because yoga right. is a bond. So they'll say like uh, uh, yoga, which means during uh the sexual interaction blah 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 you know and it's like so yeah so yoga obviously that that means union it means the the practice of yoga you know so you, the word yoga can mean so many things because it's just a merging of something or even with the astrology with our yoga for our planets which is the combination of the planets or something yeah that's great. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, anyway, so basically the next chapter in the Vrita Yavana Jataka, it's never been translated. So what I'm doing and I'm almost done. So what I've done is I've translated all the chapters dealing with impregnation throughout the canon. Now the next step 
and I did a rough draft of the Vrita Yavana Jataka, third chapter of impregnation, but there's some problems with the verses that I just got to hopefully maybe by seeing another text, it'll help fill in the gaps because when you translate, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Or the, it'll just sometimes be very hard to translate. Like the Yavana Jataka, even Pingree says himself that it was, it's very, very difficult because there's a, a lot of the documents have uh, are smudged out. So you got to guess because there's holes in the document and, oh, right, right. and so, and Bill Mock's working on that too. And actually, um, I've been trying to get a hold of I this is a printout from the Pandit uh website. And basically there's this, they call it the Q document, and it's basically in a Nepali script. So and so the script actually is not Devanagari like we're used to. It looks like this. So this is what the text looks like in mm, that okay. Q document. So what I would like to do is to this is for the, actually the Yavana Jataka. What I'd like to do is get a digital copy of that if it is available online, but it's probably not. I know Bill Mock has a copy, but I, I don't know if he is sharing that publicly online, but uh -huh. that, that would be great to get, you know, because this is, I don't know, when I do this work, a lot of times I feel like Indiana Jones, you know, like yeah. you find like these treasures and right. it's just really amazing. Yeah. That's fantastic. You know, I wanted to, a couple things. I we we actually shared that Garga text. You and I went back and forth with that. That that was translated, and that really I've meant to talk about this, and I I, I need to bring this out myself. Where especially with the Tithis, it was the Titi. All of this stuff about the Tithis. Remember where mm -hmm. instead of having it, instead of the Tithis being defined categorically as Nandra Badra Jaya Rik the Purna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Nanda Badra Jaya Rikta Purna was the names of the first four tith uh, same the names of the first five tithis, mm -hmm. and then tithis six through you know then the rest of them had different names. Right. So right now, the way the tithis are described, and I believe it's from Varahana here. I think it's from Brihad mm -hmm. Samhita. I believe mm -hmm. that the tithis are categor they're categorized as Nanda Badra Jaya Rikta Purna, mm -hmm. and you have. Three Nanda Titis, three Bhadra Titis, three um, Jaya Titis, Rikta, and Purna Titis. So, so Titis 1, 6, and 11 are Nanda, and then mm -hmm. Bhadra, Jaya, Rikta, and the Rikta Titis 4, 9, and 14 are the different ones, and then the Purna. But in, in the Gargajotish, if you remember, Nanda, Bhadra, Jaya, Rikta, Purna was just the names of the first five Titis. They weren't categories of Titis that repeat three times like we're used to doing now. So it's an entirely different, entirely different schema of the Tithis. Right. Exactly. Do you remember seeing that? Yeah, no, I remember that when, you know, Bill Mock came out with that. And then, yeah, we talked about that. I definitely Yeah, we, we knocked that back. I was like, yeah. my God, this is like, nobody has ever seen this before. Mm -hmm. So people should understand there's some incredible stuff right now being translated. Yeah. And Mike is on the verge of it. And I'm totally psyched that you're going to be one of the few to bring out this Vridya Yavana Jataka in its full form. Is it available? Is the full thing available? Or do we just have those few chapters? Um, just a few chapters. That, um, like in back of me, this is the Hindi version. So this, the, and, but there's some differences between um, the Pingri uh, Vridya Yavana Jataka manuscript and what's in here, but it's pretty close. But this is basically, we just got the Hindi. So I'm literally... I've learned a little bit of Hindi because I, when I need a little help, I'll go to the Hindi books. So, okay. <laughs> I've, but I got that, it. Yeah. Yeah. There's no um, English translation of the Vridhi Yavana Jataka aside from the first two chapters that okay. I'm aware of. And, Oh, but Valerie Roebuck did do some later. I think she did two others. She sent me the two others on the email. Um, I talked with her, but other than that publicly, there's only two. So. You know, one of the things I also just wanted to say, I wanted to also really, one of the things I really appreciate about what you're doing is that, and I wanted to get your feedback on this a little bit too, is that, um, you know, obviously I, I've been having to look at the translation, the Sanskrit translation from Indians, which I mean, the, you know, they're excellent, um, obviously, but uh, as a native English speaker, um, mm -hmm. it's definitely different. It's a different read to yeah. get it from someone who is a different, who is a, who is an English speaker, because obviously, you know, one of the things that I notice is that it's probably, 
and I, I think because, you know, and it's no commentary on the accuracy, mm-hmm. but because Indians aren't non, you know, because they aren't English, they might use more words than you would need to use in order to try to convey a meaning, which might skew a meaning or which might do certain things that because we speak English, I could use a, a, one or two words much more concisely than several conditional words to try to convey the same thing. One of the things I've noticed is it just reads so clean, like, especially when I go back and if I feel like looking at how you arrived at that, um, it reads very clean and economical. Have you noticed this? Like, what's your view about some, uh, you know, about a lot of the Indian translations? And I know you're too respectful to give them a hard time about it, but relative to the thing that I just said about it being much more clean and where you've also maybe noticed something like this in the Indian translations. Yeah, the biggest critique I would say of previous translations is sometimes they're they're not literal enough. So when I'll tr- when I'll be translating a verse, I'll obviously go back to the previous translators and see what they did and and get a kind of you know where where is this verse at? And a lot of times they'll they'll write what's not in the verse, and I'm like I'll translate. And it's like it's that word's not even in the verse. What are the, or that whole phrase is not in the verse. And I know why they did it because that's the way you practice something, but they didn't say it. And that's my, always my biggest critique is like. You said, and you said they did it because that's the way you what? That's the way that it's commonly known to be done. So they'll be like, well, this is the way, this is what we'll say the word is, but it's like, whoa, whoa, hold up here. It's like, right. so they'll, they'll just write all this extra stuff into the verse that's not in there because the Sanskrit language is very economical. So if you have a whole verse where like, for example, like um, fish are like couples are in Gemini and, and a crab is in cancer, you know, they'll, they'll have a phrase like this should be this, this should be this, but they're not going to keep saying should be, they're going to just going to have one should be in the whole sentence and then have the two other, the subject and the object and just, Get, have you figure out right where to stick that verb yeah and, they, um, <clears throat> right yeah so that's that that would be the biggest critique is is like why why don't you just do the verse and then do a commentary on that verse and then explain it and because a lot of times when i see a verse with there's a lot of input in it and, and this is for me too when i start translating a verse if i start throwing in words then when I actually figure it out, then I then I can actually take out all them extra words because I've really figured out the verse. And, and, and you know, I try to write it as literal as possible, literally as the verb, as the verse is going, I'll put it. So like, for example, in a Sanskrit verse, it usually has two parts. There's usually divided into two parts. So usually that first part of the verse in, in astrology texts, especially, is like the um, the dependent clause, and then then the second verse, the second line will be the independent clause. So it'll be like when Mars is in the first house, comma, you know, blah 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 blah, you know, and 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 so you can, there is no word order in Sanskrit, so that's but you can kind of see they're grouped you know, in general, usually they're grouped. It's very rare when you take one word from the first part of the verse and the last verb and put them, the last word and put them together. There is some general grouping. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I also wonder because, you know, obviously I, I have a real keen interest, not, uh, I mean, obviously in all of this, but certainly with a lot of the Zodiac issues um, that have come up and you know, just as someone who's looked into these texts, I mean, I don't know, it's maybe sort of redundant to say, but is, is there any doubt in your mind that they were using, that they were using sidereal zodiac and that they knew they were using it and that it was pretty clear that that's what they were doing? Yeah, exactly. It's this, it's very, especially, you know, like when I saw it, when I started translating and saw like, oh, they considered all them words like riksha, kshetra, ba. They mean all the same. They're yeah. all talking about a zodiac sign. And even when they talk about houses, like something in the seventh house, they'll say something in the seventh zodiac sign. Right. So they yeah. even there, they will use house names that were associated, like Aya is the 11th house. or But 
a lot of times they'll say, oh, this is the, you know, third house. And even one recent translation to name the third house, they said the eighth of the eighth. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. So he, that here's one of the most, yeah. And here's one of the, here's one of the, one of the most amazing examples because, you know, I have up here and I've put this out quite a bit. Um, these are the translations of, of all of the, of, you know, the major texts of the sidereal zodiac in Vedic astrology. I mean, in every Vedic astrology text, I mean, literally like a text, it refers to the zodiac sidereally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they're all, it's always aligned with the nakshatras and the rashis. Usually, um, there's you know there's always a, a very intentional declarative statement mm -hmm. that says, like for example, from Parashara, those are grahas that move through the nakshatras. The said zodiac comprises 27, commencing from Ashwini. Same area is divided into 12 equal parts and rashis. I did look through the same. In your text as well, in your translations with Brihat Jataka, it says the sim almost exact, I mean, really exactly the same thing. They're each formed by nine padas, starting with Mesha and Ashwini. In Horasara, they say the same thing, that Ashwini and Aries um, and, uh, um, and the um, two and a quarter stars or um, nine padas. In Jataka Parijita says the same thing. Surya Siddhanta at the very beginning as well, the mean motion of the planets. The very beginning is talking about the planets, which again are moving through the sky. And it says that they move westward, they end in Pisces, then you start the zodiac circle. So it's very clear. But what I was really, what was really amazing, and it's in this, and it's in this text that's the commentary, which is fantastic because it's a compendium, like I said at the beginning, of, of what's said in all these different texts. You'll see this synonym, synonyms of the zodiac signs as a whole, and particular ones as well. And I've noticed this before, but I didn't know this showed up in every text. I've seen it in Brihat Samhita, but I didn't know it was in all of them. Yeah. You see here, it says Rashi, Kshetra, Gra, uh, Gurha, Riksha, Ba, and Bhavana. The terms are one and the same. So they're basically saying Rashi and Bhava, the terms are one and the same. Uh, and the names of Bhavana, zodiac signs are Riksha, Rashi, Kshetra, indeed, Ba, the same thing. Rash, um, Riksha, what's, what is uh, Riksha? Is this? Uh, Riksha, that's a zodiac sign, yes. It's, it's also zodiac sign, yeah, that's what I thought. Riksha, Bhavana, Kshetra means like field or, yep. Yep. right? Um, yeah. And then Hora are synonyms of the Rashi. Kshetra, Riksha, Rashi, Bhavana, those are named Ba's. Uh, again, you see it over and over again. Rashi and Bhava are the same thing. Yeah. And again, so what does that really mean? Um, what I've what I've noticed and what I put together is you, you can see this is here's these here are these quotes that I that I just pulled out from Prashanti's um, um, paper. I call him Prashanti, by the way, Mike Neely. I know I call him Prashanti. <laughs> <laughs> calls me Sadashiva. So forgive me. If I say Prashanti, it's this guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it says Rashis and Bhavas are nailed to the same thing. The sidereal space, the Nirayam chakra, which is literally what the zodiacs are. In India, you don't have sidereal and tropical. Those are Western terms. You have Nirayana and Sayana. Sayana means it's, they're both measurements of space. One is measuring space with the ayana, and one is measuring without the ayana. Again, very simple language. Near ion without the solstice, and scion with the solstice. So it makes very clear that the rushis, which are already, like we already saw, were, were absolutely defined sidereally, aligned with nakshatras, rushis, and nakshatras aligned in the sidereal near ion chakra, are also nailed to the bhavas. So bhavas and rashis are all nailed to the same thing, the scion, I'm sorry, the nirayan space. This is why when we see a planet at any degree in a sign, it's also seen as being in that entire house as well. This is why you don't have all of these exotic house systems in Vedic astrology. You didn't get these house systems until Sripati in the 11th century, which was hundreds of years after the Indians were interacting with the Persians. And by extension with the Greeks and the Westerners, then you started seeing some of these different house systems. The first one is the Sripati. But before that, everything was whole sign, whole house. And why? Because it's all being nailed to the same sky. It's the same thing. And it even says it in all of those texts. So this illustration here, I just have, 
you know, we're used to seeing the zodiac is like a circle here. But again, if you stretch it out as space, it would look something like this. And you'd have planets just kind of somewhere along that, that, that line. I just have it as a line. 12 30 degree portions, Rashi's signs and Bhavas, occupying the same space aligned with 27 nakshatras of 1320 and portioned to nine padas of 320 each. That is the absolute foundational organizing principle around everything in Vedic astrology. Simple. That's it. There's really no discussion. It's very clear. And again, if people want to do other things, they can, but it doesn't change this. This is just built into every text. I mean, would you agree? I would agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's really clear. Like when that whole um, Zodiac debate, well, that's the reason I translated the Vedanga Jyotisha. It's like, well, let's go back to the earliest document that we have. And one of the first major calculations they address is the Naksatras within the Ayana framework. They say, okay, this is how many Naksatras pass through an Ayana. And, and it's just, it's very clear, and that text is super, super complicated. And right, it's, it's very like, complicated, but that part's not complicated yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very clear. It's very clear that they're talking about nakshatras in there, and they're they're being very distinct when you're talking about ayana, when you're talking about nakshatra. When yep, you're they're very clear. Yeah, yeah. They understand very clearly the difference between what what what's being measured with the calendar, which are yeah. seasons. Yeah. And ayanas and all of that, and the and the sidereal um, measurement. Like I say here, it's just this is very quick. It just over. It's just kind of like a um, overview. They measure sidereal time and space in the Vedanga Jyotisha. We see that the year length, three hundred and sixty six days for the solar year. In there are six seasons, two ayanas. In the year there are twelve solar months. Five years make a yuga. All of that is organized at the same time in the same way. All of it. They're not saying 366 days and nakshatras. And no, yeah. they're saying all of this is a group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here is this stuff. Then they start getting into things that are clearly sidereal and measuring. When sun and moon occupy the region of the zodiac together with the asterism, with the asterism or the nakshatra of Shravista, at that time begins the yuga, which is a five-year cycle. They are talking about the synodic month of Magha, the solar seasonal month called Tapas, the bright fortnight, and their northern course. So they're showing that they're measuring all of these calendar factors with the asterism of Shravishta. Yeah, which is Danishta in which our... Which is Danishta now, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, yeah. then they say also that, um, that the southern course begins in Asalesha. But they're talking about these, these calendar phenomena but they're measuring them with the sky. So you want to understand that the Zodiac is literally the sky that's measuring all of this. It's measuring planets moving through the sky and it's measuring other things like Ionas and solstices and, and the procession. What do you think the procession is being measured against? It's being measured against the thing that's not moving. That's what it is. Right. And so, and then he, and then he continues and, and, the, and then he says, um, Again, when situated at the beginning of Shravishta, the sun and moon begin to move north. When they reach the midpoint of Asalesha, they begin moving south. Now, this is why people like myself and a lot of Indian scholars backdate the Vedanga Jyotisha to the time of 1200 to 1500 BC. It's not just because we want to try to act like everything is older. It's because there's a clear indicator of time here. This is how they measure time. So when we look at this, we're saying, well, this must have been written at a time when that was true. And so, but when Michael sees something where the Sanskrit doesn't match up, he's like, well, but something isn't right here. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't written at this time because they're obviously indicating that this was happening, but the Sanskrit's not matching up. So maybe it was rewritten or something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Which is definitely possible because they got to rewrite it so often because they're on leaves. <laughs> That's what I said earlier. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what did we expect? Yeah. They're on leaves. Yeah. And what happened <laughs> and what we were talking about with someone like Pingree, for example, is he would see this and what he wound up doing was saying, no, this is much later. This is obviously later because of the Sanskrit. And it's like, but wait a minute, you can't necessarily say that. There could be a lot of reasons why the Sanskrit was this way. Like it was written on leaves. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Th this is why 
Liz and Prashanti and I were saying that earlier because there's a lot of subtle issues here. This is right in both of the texts. It's not even one. There's the Rig Veda and then there's the Yajur Veda that was also written. So it's in both of these texts. Okay. So it's, just, mm-hmm. it's not likely that that one was that they were both written at the at, at a different time. Did you want to say something, Prashanti? Yeah. I don't want to keep talking. Oh no, just think of the Bible. I mean, we right. only relatively recently got away from the King James Bible. Because, I mean, when, even when I was going to church when I was a kid, they had the King James Bible. We don't speak like thou hast spoken, you know. No, they changed it to the NIV or the, we, you know, it's just so, you know. But that's a great point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you update language. Exactly. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is one of the most obvious reasons why they would do it. Yeah. Because they could be looking back into the, the way that Sanskrit was written, which was dense. Like you said, that's hard to translate. It's hard translation back then. Um, and so the people, maybe as it was starting to decay, they also updated the language so that it wasn't so so hard to read. Because again, thou hath with for with the we 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 don't know what the heck that means anymore. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So very good point. Yeah. But then you actually see some very amazing things in the the things that I found that are really amazing about Vedanga Jyotisha is we see things like this four and a half asterismal segments is one season which means they were literally also measuring time with the nakshatras, which means that the sun, and they're using the sun. So this is the transit of the sun through nakshatras. That's how they're measuring time. So even this whole idea that the signs are related to the sun or the sun, again, in the, in the Indian context, they were measuring everything with the nakshatra segments, with the asterismal segments, 27 of them. And again, this is also why there are 27 nakshatras, not really 28, because it breaks up this 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 whole timing system of time and space mm-hmm. are being timed to it. So it says that four and a half asterismal segments is one season. So they had six seasons. When you multiply six times four and a half, you get 27 nakshatras. So the sun moving through four and a half nakshatras is one season. And then... And it says, and this measuring five-year yugas by the number of nakshatras transited by the sun in five years. In the same way, the total of the asterisms of the sun, which comes around five times, is 135. So again, multiply 27 times 135, and they were measuring five-year yugas based on the sun going through going through 135 nakshatras. So what would you say, Mike? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading oh, no. this from your translations. I didn't have no, it up, but we're talking fine. about it. <laughs> well, uh, just the one little, it's funny, I uh, shared this paper with, um, uh, you know, uh, a secular academic who um, was a dean at a, a college and everything. And the first thing he said to me when he saw this translation, my is like, wow, do you know a lot of businesses and governments still work off a five-year plan? You know, he was really amazed by that, that here's this, you know, I don't know if you know, they got it from there, but it's just so amazing where you have this five year period of time. And we still use that extensively in governments, in businesses, five year plans. So this is so so this is Michael's translation that I have up here. I mean, look at this. He's broken out all this math. He's condensed it in this way that is so attainable. Look, he's broken out all of this. I mean, this is just remarkable work, Mike. I, I got to just. Yeah can't congratulate you and thank you enough but look at how easy he's made this this is just amazing and he, and he goes through and, and breaks out the the overview in general again and especially this you know these verses and stuff like like in an overview he he sort of condenses it into some things that are you know easier to understand and then he gets into the um then he gets into the actual uh statements or the actual text is down here somewhere right it starts yeah 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 so first i did um so he breaks out all of this stuff which is so important go ahead i'm sorry yeah so i basically do a a a rough when i do a text like this i like to do a rough outline like you said to make it easier for people to say okay this is what they're talking about this is incredible and then what i'll do is i'll list the verses and then after the verses i'll list the verses plus the details so i like to you know kind of the more you go down, the more detailed it gets. People need to understand this is really difficult stuff. This is like all this complicated math. Dude, you're a lunatic. How in the world? <laughs> yeah. And 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 with the it's Sanskrit incredible. 
with the Sanskrit, once again, is it you? It's a different uh, type of language, so you got to learn how to basically read um, math problems. You know, just like you you got to see how they make like a lot of times in the Sanskrit texts and the astrology ones, they'll say like two times six, which means twelve, and you have to just know that oh, that's what they're talking about, right? You know? So, and the math notation, and sometimes when I was working on this text, even though I had um, uh, a couple of translations to work with, sometimes I literally worked four hours in one night on one verse trying to figure it out. Just because I just didn't want to take that person's for, you know, word for granted. I wanted to do it myself and say, okay, he was right. You know, that's, that is, you know, it's like, I really wanted to do it myself. I wasn't just going to take someone else's translations and and say, oh, okay, that's okay. No, no, you got to work through it and really get it down. Yeah. And so here's here's Michael's translations of the things that I just went through. Celestially, when the moon and the sun simultaneously rise up with Vasava, which is Danishta, thenceforward it should be the Yuga. Magha is a synodic lunar month. Tapas is a solar seasonal month. Moon is waxing, and indeed the Ayana is northward. So this is how it re- this is how he translated that. And again, you see this Vasava, which again, this is very much the deity here, which is the eight Vasus. Mm-hmm. So you can see that, and again, this is all the way it was coded back in the Vedas. You'll see that the, that the nakshatras themselves were actually even were actually even called by their deities. Um, they were actually called the deity names. Mm-hmm. Um, literally, like you won't, like often with a Slesha, they'll just call it Sarpa. They won't even call it a Slesha. Yeah. Um, so amazing work. And again, so these will all be for you to download so that you can read these amazing texts yourself. Everybody watching this should download what's underneath this video so you can look at this stuff yourself and realize that this body of knowledge, this isn't a bunch of a free-for-all bunch of opinions, man. This is documented, textual. We are so lucky to be studying Vedic astrology where there is still such a textual record. And especially of things like this, like zodiacs and whatnot, it's not even really anything to debate. It's so uniform and consistent across every text and across even every concept that we know what they were doing. And we have such a rich variety of um, of resources to pull from, like all of these different names. This is what's so valuable with what Michael has done. He's brought all of these different sort of structures from many of these different texts into one place. So you can see what he's doing is basically showing you the cross-referencing because this is what I've wound up doing, compiling things like Zodiac statements and other kinds of things. I've gone to every text I can find and see what they say, the Danga Jotish, all these other texts. And again, I, I know how hard that work is. I don't know how hard it is to do it in Sanskrit, which is, again, and and Michael has done it across all kinds of things, zodiac sign names, all these different names for the signs, everything you can imagine. He's gone and gathered all of this and, and really compiled all of this information. Yeah. Was that fun? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And so you can see that, just to come back here to this thing about the Zodiacs, because I did want to just wrap this part up, is that it's clear that the Indians did intend us to locate the planet on the sidereal plane, the ecliptic, and that sidereal ecliptic plane formed the basis of the signs and houses. They even said they were the same thing, like we just saw. The fixed rush, and by the way, this is another thing too, and I also looked at the thing you did on Rashi aspects. Mm -hmm. This is also very clear to me, the fixed Rashi aspects show this as well. Because the Rashis are always there. They don't change. Think about this. Planetary aspects are based on the planets moving. And they're calculated by exact degrees of planets moving toward each other and and, and the applying and separating aspects. Because the planets are moving relative to each other. The Rashis are fixed. They're fixed aspects. They don't move. Any planet in any Rashi is Rashi aspecting any other planet in the other Rashi that it aspects because the zodiac is fixed. It's fixed to the sidereal sky. There's no question about it. Even the bhavas are fixed to the same sidereal sky. And I've been doing this with Rashi aspects forever. Go ahead, Michael. What do you want to say? Oh, And just when you bring up the aspects, it's really, really, I mean, when you go through the text, I mean, they always have that qualifier if it's strong or if it's weak. So you really, really, really need to get your strength 
understanding of strength and aspects is a huge part of that because if you have a really bad combination, well, if you have some aspects from a benefic or benefics, it's going to smooth it out. So like, for example, like say there's a combination that is going to make you blind. Then if you have some benefics, maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe you'll have one eye blind or, you know, so it's just with the aspects, which it was kind of funny, you know, because we're so used to using the Western aspects, but with the Joe Tish text, it's those aspects, them hard sign aspects. You really got to, it's really, really, really important. You know, here's one of the things that I've noticed and I've been teaching it forever. I, I've done a, a few courses on aspects. And one of the first things that I distinguish is the difference between Rashi aspects and sign aspects. Mm-hmm. And again, there, there's even some astrologers that say Rashi aspects you know, do they work? They don't even work. What are they? They don't. And, and again, it's like, come on. <laughs> it's like, of course they work. And again, one of the main things that I've noticed is that the rushy aspects are things that are fixed. Ponder this. We often talk about how much of our karma is fixed. Like what is fixed? Like destined to like happen or be a quality that's like a fixed quality of something. And I've noticed and you can look at this too, and people out there watching can also test this, that ru- planets that Rashi aspect each other are as close to qualities and things that are fixed as almost anything I've seen. And think about the concept, because again, the Rashis are fixed to the sky. It doesn't move. It's the structure. And so the planets that Rashi aspect each other are qualities of our nature that are fixed. It's not like they're evolving or they're developing. Like planets that are in aspect, like separating or approaching aspects, these are these are qualities and the planets that are moving in relation to each other, like the trinal aspect and the this aspect, the opposition. And these are things that are like dynamic forces of change. But the fixed aspects, the rushy aspects, are the qualities of the person who's like, that's just the way the person is. Like that's their nature. It doesn't change. It's not like they're working through it. It's just like their nature. And when that karma comes up, the things that rule that karma comes up, you'll see those things happen. They're some of the most fixed. In in fact, as far as fixed karma goes, those are the things that I've seen that are pretty much, I would say, destined or just this is just the nature of the person. Mm -hmm. And I did a whole thing. I think I used Trump's chart. I used another person's chart where I showed the difference in these things Mm -hmm. between the rushy aspects and the planetary aspects and how you can see things that are absolutely just the person's nature. They're not going to change it. And things where they're always kind of working on it or working with it or, you know, just kind of going back and forth with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. And and that, you, that's the thing I love working with astrology because you get compassion for people. It's like, they can't help themselves. You know, it's like, we can't help ourselves. It's like, you know, it's, I don't, you know, and, once again, when uh, dealing with reading the Sanskrit is and like, you know, I'm going through reproofing my Bhagavad Gita stuff. And it's like, and it's so they just drive home that message is like, look, just embrace who you are in yourself. Okay. Don't apologize for yourself. You are who you are. <laughs> it's just like, just be just, you know, and, and there's going to be tension. There's going to be natural tension. And okay, that's, it is what it is. So it just really, it just makes Sometimes you- those things, like when I use Trump's chart, I talked about he, he has Rashi aspects between his Saturn Rahu in in uh, Cancer in the 12th mm-hmm. and his or no, his Saturn um, Venus in the 12th and his son Rahu in um, uh, Taurus in the 10th. So the Rashi aspect, they're, yeah. they're just fixed. Yeah. Yeah. So you literally have like Rahu aspecting Venus in the 12th. And and Saturn, which is his, which is his seventh lord. So both of the relationship indicators in the twelfth are Rashi aspected by Rahu. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that makes from sense. the tenth house. Yeah, yeah, the twelfth house, yeah. like cheating yeah. on partners, lying about partners, surrounded by what beauty pageants, porn stars, living in palatial estates. It's like this is the guy's nature. It ain't gonna change. That's yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. And and <laughs> and and that's the thing is like you know, when you see like an enemy or, or you, you, you gotta, it's, it's just like the Arjuna Krishna thing. It's like, well, 
you know, you have this bad thing or this good thing. Well, the bad thing, if you don't like the bad thing, go over and take care of it. That's your, that's your role in life to take care of it, you know? And it's like, you know, you don't have to be a coward about it. Just, you know, that's life, you know? Yeah. I wanted to finish this thing up and then, and then there's one more thing I wanted to talk about that I told you. And that was about the, um, about the, about the, um, chakras, but I also wanted to ask you, um, anything else that you wanted to also discuss, because I know you've also been interested in things like with the warfare and whatnot. So let me just talk about this last thing and then get you in on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Thing, last yeah. thing that I wanted to say about this, because it's very interesting is that, again, we want to understand that as it says here, additionally, planets are located in the sky, not based on where we are on the earth. So this is one of the ways to really understand the difference between the two zodiacs especially because one is literally the sky and the objects moving through the sky and when you look at this sidereal ecliptic at, as it says here that rashis and bhavas and these portions of sky are just nailed into it we're locating the object there only based on there we're locating the planet in the sky location is is not based on where we are on the earth now you're saying well what does that mean well the whole tropical zodiac system was developed. Again, it's not wrong. It's just calculating something different. It's calculating the spherical geometry in a different way so that we, we are measuring the ecliptic in relation to the Earth, which is this globe. This is why when you're measuring that ecliptic relative to where you are on Earth, these house systems come in and they skew the perspective. And what, what they've done in Western astrology with tropical is they've disconnected the earth from the sky in this regard. Again, it's not an insult. It's just simply what it is. This is why you have things like intercepted houses and things where you'll have houses that don't even include astrology signs because of the longitude of where you are on earth and all of this. So again, this is what tropical zodiac is really about. This is why you have all of these elaborate house systems and stuff like that. That's how that system is designed to be made. Whereas again, when you're looking at what the Indians did, it was very clean and clear. Everything is located somewhere on this band. This is why I made it this way rather than this way for this purpose, because it's just like a kind of grid. It's like a graph. It's like it's being located at a point on this 360 degree circle. That's where you're finding it, not where you are on Earth in relation to where that's intersecting, because that is very complicated. So they're locating it in the sidereal sky. Um, and, and again, this is also not based on hemispheres or other dynamic movements and archetypes often referred to when you're looking at the tropical zodiac, because this is one of the issues with tropical as well. It's a seasonal kind of zodiac, and you hear it talked about the seasons, but all of that is also completely hemisphere-based. So that's a big problem with all that. Again, one of the things with the Indian way of doing it is it's very clean and clear, and it makes sense why it was, because they were always basing everything on the sky on the nakshatras, on the eternity of the universe, not of our place on earth. So you can see it very simply, even reflected in the whole, in the whole cosmology of the entire culture, actually. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, that seems to make sense, huh? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I just want, uh, is there, um, you know, the, the one thing that I did want to ask you about was, was the whole uh, thing about, I know you were interested in that you were translating other things on warfare and other things you were doing translations on. Did you want to discuss any of that or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, the Brihat Yatra is, um, Yatra means to go out on a military expedition. So Brihat just means great, like a big, and it's basically, uh, the main reason why I wanted to start translating, even though I am a, a Marine, I served six years, so I'm a Marine veteran. So <laughs> it's, um, so, but the main reason I wanted to translate is because it's out of translation. Like there's no English translation of it. Um, there's this, um, one guy who did a few chapters for his book he did on, um, ritual, but he never published those translations, but they're in his book that he did. Um, his name's Marco, I believe. I forget his last name, Gislani. I think it's Marco Gislani um, did a book where he did some translations. But I mainly wanted to do it to because it hasn't been done. So and it, I wanted to kind of bring it back out again. So I did do a few chapters, and and I love the chapters that I did. Like uh, the philosophy you get from these texts is just amazing. It's yeah, just like, I, that you know, sounds like some great stuff. That's why I wanted to ask you about it because. Yeah. 
warfare yeah. is a, it's a, that's a very uh, interesting thing to be writing about. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's basically it was a, a there's a, another text. So Varma here, he did the Panchasiddhanta, which is mainly a mathematical text um, that sets up the astronomy and stuff, and obviously the Briat Jataka. But what people most people don't know is he did the Briat Jataka like uh, the Jataka and then like uh, uh, Lagu Jataka. So he did like three versions of it, like a, 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 a short one, a medium one, and a big one. And so we always talk about how the Brihat Jataka is so brief, but that actually was the big Jataka of Varma here. And he also did like a text on marriage um, compatibility, I believe, or something. And that that is out of print, or it's, I don't think it's ever been translated into English. And then the Brihat Yatra. And, um, that's the military expedition test. So it's basically the same. When should you go to war? If you go to war, this will happen. If this, but they use a lot of nakshatra stuff in there, and that's where um, I started to translate, and then I got stuck. So I'm hoping to circle around back in. I know there's a lot of military stuff in Yavana Jataka as well. There's a big section in Yavana Jataka where they talk a lot about that. Yeah, there's like one or two or three chapters with, and I've translated those because that's what I always do when I get stuck on a text. It's just you just take a little break and then maybe you find another text or maybe you try to translate other chapters in the text and that'll help you out. So it's a lot of times you're like, okay, I'm stuck. I, let me just take a break and come back to it. So, and so that's the main reason I, I really, really love to translate stuff that's never been translated because it's like, it's going to bring more stuff out. Like, like, I mean, there, I remember like, there's this really, uh, in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about how we make the gods and the gods make us. And by working together, that's where we create reality. Well, they have almost an exact same statement in the Brihat Yatra. And mm. it's like, it's same concept of we make the gods, the gods make us, you know, so we work together. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like almost this blend of fate and free will. Like the gods give us destiny and then we in, in turn, that's why in the Bhagavad Gita, they say, if you think about this, then you're going to go to that. If you think about Jesus, you're going to go to Jesus. If you're going to do this, you're going to go to this. If you're going to think about, it's all, where is your mind at? Yeah. It's all about where is your mind? Yeah. Well, it's great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to sh sh share this mm. too, as share you know, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this video is me sharing my inspirations about your work. So I hope mm. you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, this is the um, you know, this uh, from this one, this Ridya Yavana Jataka, which I really like. Mm -hmm. Um, these these verses on the on the signs are so they're so nice. Um, and I really the translations are so clean. You know, I'll just read few of, through a few of these. Um, and again, people, you know, need to download these because they're so nice. The first Aries is recollected as having a form similar to a ram that is said to be the head of time by ancients and the place on the path of ram and you, caves, mountains, thieves, fire, mines, and gems. But the second manifested Taurus is the form of a bull. That is the place of the mouth and neck of the creator and the place of roaming of the forest, mountains, summits, herds of elephants and cows and the forces of the field or farmers. And so these, these come through. And again, some of these are so, they're just so nice. Um, you know, I, I really like this of uh, Virgo, a maiden standing in a boat in the water, having grasped a lamp with a hand. They declare the sixth, holding half of time, the belly of the creator, a place covered with grass, women, sensual pleasures and crafts. So nice, huh? Yeah. And well, one thing I love I this Libra. I'm sorry, go ahead. So like, for example, the one on Leo, one of the things that struck me when I was looking at the iconography of uh, the Zodiac signs, which this is what it's doing, laying out the iconography is like the Yavana Jataka and the Vrita Yavana Jataka talk about a lion specifically on a mountain. But as you go through the tradition and they just say lion. So Not a on a mountain. Yeah, they don't say it's on a mountain, but the earth, that's Yavana Jataka and Vrita Yavana Jataka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the iconography is really amazing. Just how you see it shift and everything, and how once again the zodiac so key with that because it's like, is that a human sign? Is it a quadruped sign? Is it 
a water sign. Those are all very key when you try to evaluate strength. So if you don't know what the zodiac in that embodiment of that strength conditions, then some of your translations aren't going to, or inter, you know, predictions aren't going to go as you plan because you didn't properly evaluate the strength of the planet. This Libra is a man standing in a market holding commodities in a scale, that region of the navel, hips, and bladder, and a place of the pure business, venas, shops, towns, revenue, all places of residence, and tall crops. Yeah. And, and as we know, Libras usually, they just say scale. They don't say a person holding a scale in the market. Yeah. 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 It's just like, and, and yeah. And um, yeah, this is nice. I, a couple of things. Well, uh, maybe we'll talk about this too, but Sagittarius, a man armed with a bow in the rear half of a horse, they declare that is the two thighs of the director of the world and a place of level land. The dispersed and united warriors, shooters, a thunderbolt weapon, chariot, and horses. So they have them, they have the man in the front and the horse in the back. Yeah. Then the 10th Capricorn. And again, here you see that same kind of thing, like the 10th house, the 10th sign, like the Rashi Baba, the, the, like it's the same. It's this section. Yep. You're starting everything here, and this is the 10th section of it. Boom, that's it. Yep. Like, yep. It's exactly. all that. It's like that thing is declared Makara, or sea animal, with the front half of a deer in the midst of water. They consider that the region of the knee of the creator and a place of river, rivers, woods, forest, forms of lakes, and locations of chasms. So these are these are beautiful descriptions, but then what 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 really compelled me to and and what I've put together a little thing here is these last three here as he transitions or these last four however many it is it's these is then he gets into a different way of looking he goes those foremost declared all the named inanimate and animate in this world is composed of the sun and moon so he comes back and says all of it it comes from the sun and moon. Here, the arising and decrease of the sun, or I'm sorry, decrease of that is seen in the circle of the zodiac signs. Indeed, also that circle is composed of those two. So he's saying that the zodiac is really composed of the sun and the moon, and he's breaking it off in two, in, into two halves of the zodiac. And here we get with sidereal again. The arranged solar half of that circle of signs is Magha, Nakshatra, etc. Starts with Magha, and it says. In, and the et cetera is the, is that the prefix or the suffix Adi? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Adi, Adi, Adi means like et cetera. Or et cetera. Be- and the ones that follow. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So when you know there are more, it's like, like Jagrad Adi. Mm-hmm. Yep. They're called Jagrad Adi Avashtas because it's Jagrad Swapna Sushupti because it's. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the Adi. Yeah. yeah. So it says the arranged solar half of that is Magha Nakshatra. And then the rest. And the arranged lunar of the other half is Sarpa Nakshatra, which is Aslesha, and then the rest. By that order of the planets, the sun gave, thus indeed the Lord of the stars, the moon, by the reverse. So he's saying that the zodiac would then start with, with Magha in this schema of connecting the zodiac to the sun and moon. You start with Magha Nakshatra with the solar section and Aslesha nakshatra in the reverse with the lunar. Yep. As corresponding to those two by two in the zodiac signs of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the accurate result is bestowed according to the wise. So now he's saying, as corresponding to those two by two, which rule two signs in the zodiac of Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. So you start with the sun and the moon, and then you have the two of Mercury, the two of Venus, the two of Mars, the two of Jupiter, the two of Saturn. And then he says, indeed, thus odd and even of those are indicated as giving a masculine and feminine result. So then they switch, masculine and feminine, in their own cruel, innate dispositions and auspicious personifications, and the movable, immovable, and mixed, respectively. All those are arranged by one's own nature among those benefic and malefic. So then he's just saying that all of those attributes arrange themselves around the zodiac this way. So again, this is just gorgeous, gorgeous sequence of saying all those signs and then showing the zodiac as being partitioned into a masculine and a feminine, starting with, and again, Leo Cancer, and of course, Magha and Aslesha. And so we go here. 
And this is what I just read. So rather than read it all again, I highlighted this part. The arranged solar half of that circle is Mugha. The arranged lunar half is Sarpa. By that order of the planets, the sun gave thus indeed the Lord of the stars, the reverse. And then as corresponding among those two, the zodiac signs of Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, the accurate result is bestowed according to the wise. So we can take a look at this. And this is a way to reckon this astrology chart and the sidereal chakras, okay? Now, this has long been something that I've been using, and it's been described. I think David Frawley described it. I've heard other teachers describe the, the zodiac itself as a mandala of the chakras with Cancer and Leo up here at the top, the sun and the moon, and the Ajna chakra. This is also straight out of Raja Yoga. We have the Ida and the Pingala Nadi, the sun and the moon, the masculine and the feminine. And then we have the masculine and the feminine descending through the two signs. Again, this is sun and moon up here. These are Mercury signs. These are Venus signs, Mars signs, Jupiter signs, and Saturn signs, just like he said in those verses, the two of the other planets break out. And this is what he was talking about with the Nakshat, with the, with the Zodiac broken out that way. He's saying that this is the solar half over here, starting with Magha. And this is the lunar half over here, starting with Aslesha, moving backward. Pretty amazing. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, it's, and, and uh, when, when I read those verses, and, and there's some other verses uh, in the canon where, um, and it's really key because like in Western astrology, there's like two camps of, you know, are the planets connected to the zodiac signs and, and not and like that. And in Jyotish, it's very, very clear that those planets are in those assigned, those zodiac signs, given their innate natures. Yeah, these it's classical specific. rulerships are not yeah. up, for, up, up for grabs. Correct. Yeah, they're very specific that the reason why that planet is in that zodiac sign is it's it's they use the yugunas. It's gunas resonates with that portion of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Seeing Very this good. was just I I loved <clears throat> just how intentional this part as well. Well, I could just go back here. Wait a second. Yeah. Well, I'll just go here. This as corresponding among those two by two mm -hmm. in the zodiac signs of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. This two by two. These two, because the sun and moon are the one, are, are separate entities of the two luminaries of masculine and feminine, and then two by two are the other ones. They eat, the other ones rule the two signs, and they descend downward as the zodiac spreads out this way, just like this. So Leo, this is the, so Leo rules this side, or I'm sorry, the sun rules this side of the sun, moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn portion of the zodiac and the sun and and the moon rules this side of the of the mercury venus mars jupiter saturn portion they go like that and this is this is broken out into it's a similar concept in what's called the thema mundi in the um in the um how the how the how the planets got their rulerships in the in the hellenistic um tradition yeah. but um you know, this is uh, that I just thought this was a gorgeous uh, piece of work here. This this whole section, all of this is just great. I mean, again, I, I can't thank you enough for 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 doing these translations, um, for really bringing this work out. And I want to have you back on because there's so much we didn't really get to talk about, but we're we've already gone an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Fast. yeah. And just real quick yeah. about. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Talk more. Yeah. Real quick about the sun and moon. Yeah. So it's interesting throughout the tradition they start with the sun and moon, and 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 when I translated that verse and saw that, it's like wow, that's a really kind of easy astrology technique is see some, where someone's planets are in the solar solar and lunar half. So it's just really interesting just seeing just that dynamic. But then later in the tradition, they start dividing that up. And it's like, no, no. Then they say, oh, okay, well, there's another way where we're, you know, it's kind of like sun and moon with the horror, like in the odd signs, it's half is sun, then half is moon. And in an even sign, it's the first half is moon and second half is sun. Okay. And, and, and actually, this is one of the things I found that 
um, I believe that Pingri missed is like, there's a lot of cross referencing. So like the Brihat Jataka is referencing like this is, they're saying, okay, this is our horror technique for the sun and moon. But then there's another technique, which I refer to the Yavana Jataka and the Yavana Jataka does the exact opposite. They're like, okay, this is our technique, but then these guys over here have this technique. And so there is this obvious cross-referencing, you know, and whereas it's like, you know, we like to think like it just came from the Yavana Jataka into India and, you know, one, it was one way transmission. It's like, no, no, no. They were, they were talking to each other. They were doing, they were calculating these things. different. So are yeah. you saying that this was an original way to calculate the horror chart? Well, in the, so they first start out in the tradition, like we just covered here, where like half the Zodiac is the sun and then the other half is the moon. But, but what I'm saying is, is was that the calculation for the horror chart? Like for anything on that side of the Zodiac, it was the, it was Leo and the other half was cancer because from, I didn't oh, know no, that no. that was a calculation for horror chart itself. No, it was just sun and moon. It's just sun and moon, the Lords for the horrors. But uh, the Yavana Jataka calculates it a little bit different than the... Oh, yeah. No, Yavana Jataka does. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's just dealing with the sun and moon. And once again, that... Because I, I, I think when I was learning astrology, like there is this modern view where don't they take like the first half of the sign is like the Lord of that house and then the second is the, the sign opposite of it? Does that ring well, a bell? The way the horror, I think, is yeah. calculated is the first half of a feminine sign is the moon and the second yeah. half is the sun kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, so, but yeah, it's all sun. Honestly, I don't actually use the horror chart that much. Um, yeah. So, I, I, I part of it is because of that, because I've not really gotten, uh, it, it, this, this is also why I was asking you, because I've, yeah. I've not really you know tapped into the use of the horror chart as much it's just a it's a two divisional so anyway well, the we're from translating the text what i would get from the horror is just noting if someone's going to be more feminine or masculine so if, if, if yeah. someone is more feminine or masculine yeah yeah more if this could be more solar cruel or more passive yeah mm -hmm. lunar and so that's how i would that's that's what the the verses I've read, that's basically what they say is like, well, is it in its lunar half? Like if you get lunar planets and lunar uh, lunar auroras, then you're going to have a really- I usually do this by looking at masculine planets and masculine yeah. signs. I just look at the, at the elements usually. Yeah. yeah. Just from the Rashi chart, like, you know, yeah. the sun in a masculine sign, moon in a feminine sign or Venus, yeah. whatever. But, yeah, you know, one of the, a few things- um, there's several things that we didn't talk about that, you know, I'd like to have you back again um, okay. for sure. And at least talk about, and, and talk about some of the, you know, cause things coming up as we talk, yeah. it's always like this, even when we chat on the phone before yeah. you know it, it's been two hours. Yeah, exactly. We always talk for like an hour or two hours. <laughs> yeah, I know. So at least, at least we had this lay, we have this outline. So we, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, so that was good. But um, especially some things that came up, especially around like, um, you know, I'd really like to delve into some of the um, issues around what's an authoritative text, especially because like the exegesis, because one of the things that I've really noticed is that you'll find the most important things like at the beginning of the book mm -hmm. and then later in the book, it's less, it, which is one of the reasons why, for example, even when I have my Zodiac quotes, I don't even include Yavana Jataka in the in the, in the Zodiac quotes anymore. I don't really consider it frankly legitimate enough in that regard because they don't even define the Zodiac until the last chapter or something, at least in the version that we have right now. Now, maybe that's a, maybe that's not accurate, but you always see that at least with it, with the texts that seem to be legitimate or the ones that you're looking at here or that I've looked at, you always see this kind of especially the definition of a Zodiac, because again, it's so important because it's the kind of structure upon which everything else is being hung. Mm -hmm. Why are you talking about aspects and signs and whatnot if you haven't even decided what, how to calculate it yet? You exactly. haven't even told them what you're calculating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so, so you always see these indicators at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Like you always see those important things at the beginning. Um, and again, the same thing was true with these texts that that you translated as well. But 
yeah, there's a, there's a lot more here to um, to unpack. Um, anything else that you wanted to add uh, before we end here? No, just like um, I appreciate everyone who comes to the academia.edu set. I really appreciate all the support and people downloading my translations and you know because i actually when i first started that i just put up those briha prashahor shastras just as a whim because at that time i took a break from sanskrit and and i was shocked when i just came back one day and i was like oh my gosh all these people came here and it's like and i just started like okay and i just felt moved to get back into it so i really appreciate it you know and you know if you want to go to patreon and Support me fine, but you oh, know, you got yeah, Patreon. Yeah. Come on, man. Well, yeah, we're gonna. Oh, yeah, it's, we're gonna it'll... get you out there, man. Come yeah. on. I have to tell you this. You, um, even you don't know this, but you're kind of like in in, <laughs> in my mind. I'm not gonna blow you up here, but yeah, as a yeah. Virgo, he, Mike as a Virgo ascended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other things, I won't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but when I'm t- when I'm thinking about the. The Virgo, the like expert, the like anonymous expert, humble Virgo, often in my mind, you're what I'm explaining in my head, yeah. and, yeah. or you're kind of what I'm thinking <laughs> of, oh, no, come on, if you don't want to do it, no, man, we got to get your, I want to get your work out there more, so, yeah. okay, so you got Patreon, so we'll get that, you have websites, yeah. so all your information will be uh, below, but is there a website that you want to put out, or is it just the academia.edu, and then, yeah. and then the Patreon? Yeah, I just prefer to push everyone to the academia because I prefer sure. that model. And if people I get it. always message me, it's just I've been I've dabbled with a website. Maybe I'll do that when I do my Bhagavad Gita videos and stuff. But at this point, I really like to just streamline everyone toward to that academia section. I hear you. It's yeah. a good idea. So we'll make sure to have all those links down there. Also to your Patreon. And, you know, again, uh, thank you so much. It's been fantastic talking to you. We'll have you on again. All right. Thanks, Father Stephen.